Hello and welcome to the Kitchen Conversations podcast. My name is Patricia Rozvora and I'm the host of this platform where we speak about contemporary art from so-called Eastern Europe. In each episode, you're going to be introduced to an artist or researcher whose visual or activist practice sheds light onto the complex former socialist region with all its histories, cultures, languages, foods, but also traumas and their inevitable contemporary consequences. The podcast is a fully independent platform existing since May 2020. If you enjoy the monthly conversations and want to leave me a motivating feedback, you can now go to buymeacoffee.com slash kitchen conversations and show your support by buying me a symbolic coffee. All the needed links you can find in the show notes of this episode. Welcome back. In June, I traveled to Warsaw to celebrate my mother's birthday. On that occasion, with a small recorder at hand, I also visited the private home of Katarzyna Kozyra, that is also the, so to speak, headquarters of her foundation. Katarzyna Kozyra is one of the most well-known Polish artists active in the scene since the 90s, as her road to national and international recognition was long and not easy. Back in 2012, she has opened a foundation to help female artists and women working in culture in Eastern and Central Europe promote their work. Today, I'm very honored to speak with the current director of the foundation, Iga Maria Szczepańska, about their current projects with a special focus on the amazing secondary archive. The podcast will begin with an introduction by the icon herself, Katarzyna Kozyra. My name is Katarzyna Kozyra. I'm living in Warsaw. I finished uh, the Art Academy uh, a long time ago, like 30 years or maybe, or 14 or 30 probably years That's how ago. old I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just had my 30th birthday, uh-huh. like a week ago. So. Oh. <laughs> I studied sculpture, but I was at a professor's studio where we could do really anything. So people were mainly not doing sculpture, but installations, performances, photographs. Whatever videos, I don't think that we did videos at the time because nobody had a video camera by then. Mm. I finished sculpture with a diploma called Pyramid of Animals. I think still a lot of people know you from this work, right? And it's quite amazing that it was your graduation work. Yeah. And it's so powerful till these days. And I became immediately known because it created a big scandal. It was also interesting because it was the first time in Poland when uh, a piece of art, let's say, uh, went outside the small group of people that were doing art. Uh, There were a lot of public discussions public accusations in media. Many people took the chance to to talk, as we know, in the former Poland before the transition. Socialist Poland, yeah. Yeah, socialist Poland. People didn't have access to media. So now everybody had the chance to cry out whatever they think and uh, whatever yeah, yeah. they think. So it caused a huge trauma, of course, for some years. Katarzyna's piece, Pyramid of Animals, consisted of four life-size taxidermy, so stuffed animals, arranged atop of one another. A horse, a dog, a cat and a rooster. Additionally, the installation showed a single channel video projection of a horse being put down and skinned. The third part of the work featured an artist statement that can also now be viewed on her website. Paradoxically, a project against consumerism, hypocrisy and killing was portrayed by the media as a work by a heartless animal murderer. What the artist wanted to highlight symbolically and actually turned against her. The later works of Katarzyna Kozyra were not less thought-provoking and for some scandalous. For her video installation Men's Bathhouse, presented at the 48th Venice Biennale, Kozyra entered a men-only bathhouse dressed as one of them and filmed and observed them with a hidden camera. 
for one of her recent projects, Cosera threw a big party celebrating her 60th birthday. The event took place in the foyer of Theater Powszechny in Warsaw, with decorative lights, balloons, live music, good food and wine. In a central position of the room, laying on a simple couch, Cosera slept throughout, absent from the start to finish, while the guests all around toasted, chatted, ate and drank. You have a wonderful, broad website and a, a lot of information about you, of course. But perhaps since you are here now, you can say in your own words, what is important for you in making art? Why are you making art all these years? I mean, I'm not good for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a gardener, I heard. Uh, yeah, yeah, garden. Yeah, yeah. I'm working in the garden. like, <laughs> And I'm not patient enough to do anything else. Everything that is structured makes me tired. Also, I don't <laughs> have the ability to, to, to be structured. So There's a space where you can be yeah. yourself. And yeah, and uh, always with a different subject, with different people, in different time. The only thing that really fits me is uh, doing art projects. And what is like your inspiration? Issues that ca come into my mind. I always consider an issue if it's worth working on it because I'm also really very, 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 very... Jak to się nazywa, że jest się leniwym bardzo? Lazy. I'm really lazy <laughs> and I don't have a motivation. I only have motivation when, uh, uh, when I know that I'm able to do something. My way of work is just following my intuition. I select everything that my intuition tells me doesn't fit. I live out and just go what what feels good. What fe feels feels the, the best. Is there like any artwork or research or project that is like the closest to your heart, or is it always the new newest one that mm, you like the most? Always the newest one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When I'm into something, it's very difficult for me to uh, to stop it. So all the projects are very deeply investigated. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it's very difficult to suddenly to get out of the world mm -hmm. and start something new. So. so you have to kind of go for it. And when you feel it's finished, yeah. then you start. Yeah, when I really don't have anything to do anymore, I finish and <laughs> then I need a lot of time to recover. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I start a new one if I have an idea. If not, I'm just waiting. Can you tell us what are you working on at the moment? At the moment, I'm living in, uh, in Zahenta. I was asked by the curators to invent a performance. And as I was always very close to Zahenta, before the set changed for some years, I don't remember for how many years, two, three, they changed the director into somebody that is really not capable to, yeah. to, to manage. So I thought that time is right to get close with Zahenta again. So I decided, okay, so I'm just moving in for a while and give a sign that uh, artists can return. Occupy. Occupy and return, <laughs> yeah. I have my own space there with a bed, with my staff, with a table, with chairs from my home, computer, some books, a lot of stuff. And... It's, of course, a total mess there, and like always. <laughs> and <laughs> mainly I stay in bed and read or make drawings or something or talk by phone or checking emails. And I also observe, I'm observed, and I also observe how people behave. So it's really very different. Some of the people just sneak sneak in and hide and run away. They're and scared, yeah. yeah. They're scared. Conf yeah, confronted. Confronted, mm -hmm. yeah. Some people walk in and ask how it feels to be a, an object or something like this. I'm answering that I totally do don't feel like this. And when they ask me if it's not tiring, constantly the public around, I tell no, because I'm really, I, I totally don't care. 
And this is uh, also strange because it was something I wanted to investigate, how it is to be constantly among people and among strangers. Uh, but I start to care when uh, people walk in, ask questions, start a discussion. Very often there are very intimate things that people tell me. And this is something I really didn't expect because I'm, I'm a strange, stranger. They are strangers to me. Somehow it starts that they start to talk about really private things. I invite them, they can sit on my bed, they can, they can feel comfortable. But when I'm tired, probably I have a very bad face expression, then nobody dares to, <laughs> <laughs> to chat to you. <laughs> yeah. Your face expression tells yeah. everything. And as Kasia left our conversation to rest in another room, I continued chatting to Iga Maria Szczepańska about the Katarzyna Kozyra Foundation. The foundation was established in 2012 and the main goal was to support female artists from the Central and Eastern Europe. Also because of Kasia's experience, even though she got recognition right away after graduating because of her piece, her graduation piece being uh, so known, despite that she still faced certain difficulties, uh, lack of funding, censorship, etc. So she decided to open a foundation to support other creatives. And what we do is to support their artworks and practices through making exhibitions, publications, and our flagship project at the moment is the secondary archive. Um, so we archive their practices but rather they archive their own practices in a way. And it just grew in the last four years in a very amaz amazing way. So now we have uh, with us, there's 12 partners and over 450 artists. That's so funny that uh, Katarzyna at the beginning was uh, saying that she's a very lazy person, but yet she started this foundation which seems to be very, very active. <laughs> so I think the truth is somewhere in between, I guess. Your involvement is also very important. I guess you're a hard work. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have really amazing people and collaborators and partners. That's the thing, like, working in arts can be really hard. And many people know this, that, you know, lack of funding, uh, crazy hours often, etc. But the people just make it so special. So it's really amazing to to see everyone's involvement. And, you know, coming from, like, coordinators to even, like, interns working specifically on this project it's really amazing to see everyone just like really committed and can you um, say a few sentences about collaborating with Katarzyna and her involvement in the foundation it's a very unique situation because as Kasia said herself she doesn't really work in structure however she makes things things happen around her she has this amazing energy she's very straightforward very honest and I think because of that, she creates relationships with people. And through that, we are able to make lots of things because she suddenly, like, you know, I'm up to my, like, you know, head covered in, like, things to do. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to find a person who does this and that. And she's like, actually, you know what? I have this person and, and suddenly things just happen. So it's definitely very, very nice in that way. But yes, sometimes it's, it goes in this like exchange, you know, because then uh, me and Pamela, who's working with us and she's mainly in uh, her coordinator, co coordinator of her projects. She's like, Kasia, do you know that like in 10 minutes we have this thing? And she's like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think we complement each other and our skills complement each other as well. Yeah, that's, I think, uh, the best combination. And what is your uh, personal background? How do you come into working in an artistic foundation like that? Well, I graduated performance art myself. So I'm also a performance artist. And actually my thesis, BA thesis focused on censorship so that was in 2019 when the works of Katarzyna and Natalia were removed from the National Museum. So I was actually writing about her, but I lived in London at that time. And then the pandemic hit and I came to Poland and I was a bit lost because I've been away for like six years. 
And I started working with certain NGOs, realized that I'm capable of making projects uh, that involve this type of structure where you apply for a grant, then you realize the grant, you have this administrative part beyond the creative, which many people creatives just don't have capacity to do or time or you know or the organization skills yeah (laughs) yeah so turns out I do (laughs) so I was like actually let me use it then from Uh, all the NGOs that I worked with I knew that I would be the most happy to work with an arts and working in performance when I found out that uh, Katarzyna Kozyra Foundation is looking for someone to first manage because I first came as a manager their activities I was like Okay, seems like a perfect opportunity. Let's see if it works out. The foundation has been working through all the political changes in Poland and that's of course quite striking because the artists you're trying to archive and support and the, the publications you're making, uh, I would say it's rather difficult to, to, to promote those artists in a conservative place like Poland since recently. I mean, it's changing and I think there's a lot of amazing people working here as well, but can you maybe comment on that a bit? Especially with our secondary archive project, Project, we still work with certain difficulties. So even though the change in Poland is rather optimistic, there are still certain countries where the it's change. yet to come. And certain partners are facing even stronger difficulties like uh, war. Um, so there is definitely there are all those layers. What really helped our foundation is that we were able to acquire international funding. So EU grants, Visegrad grants, we were supported, Secondary Archive has been supported so far, so far by Visegrad Fund and Visegrad Plus with Western Balkans and our Ukrainian and Belarusian and the second Ukrainian edition through House of Europe, uh, which is managed by Goethe Institute. So without the international grants, I think it would be very difficult. However, we are still facing difficulties when it comes to like daily support and daily running, because for that, it's really difficult to get funding. It's uh, usually covered by sponsors, partners, supporters, etc., and donations. So it really is something that we need to dedicate a lot of time to and brain power to to cover that aspect. And then you said the the foundation's main project is the secondary archive that uh, I think we will mainly speak today about. But you also do other projects. So perhaps at the very beginning we can kind of point uh, those out and then we will go more uh, in detail into the secondary archive. The foundation focuses on, as I mentioned, exhibitions, publications and the archive. When it comes to exhibitions, for example, we did uh, um, Ursula Broll's exhibition. In terms of publications, for example, in 2020, we published the Polish version of Why There Are Great Ukrainian Artists. And in terms of other projects, we also started last year Przeciwstawanie, which is a series of exhibitions or like events focusing on younger generation artists, more like um, emerging artists and helping them with some solo shows or events. How would you re- translate the the title? Przeciwstawiania? It's counter becoming understanding at the cool. same time. Uh, yeah, so it was set also in still like uh, the previous political situation, but I think it still stands uh, in many ways, um, to become an artist and to gain recognition and to be a woman, it's it's still a struggle. Uh, of course, there's lots of celebrations happening, lots of change, and it's amazing, but you still have to kind of counterstand to a lot of things. So if you would have to, like, in one sentence or a few words, say what the foundation stands for or who it wants to bring forward... What would you say? What art, what artists? We don't want to select who's good enough or or established enough and whatever to be included. So what we really want is just a great family of female artists from Central and Eastern Europe. And even if you look at Secondary Archive, you can see that they are very different beliefs. They are very different structures, work approach, etc., we just want to unite women and those who work for women in arts, uh, women and identifying people. So that's another aspect uh, that's important for us that we are taking this um, 
maybe still not explored enough, but we are hoping with the next extension of the archive as well to go in this uh, bit queer aspects as well. So yeah, if we are already at the archive, uh, I guess the first question would be the name. I want to also add that Secondary Archive has been made throughout the years by many amazing curators and coordinators. So I actually wasn't at the beginning. Uh, I, As I mentioned, I joined two and a half years ago and the project started more or less four years ago. And from what I heard, there was a big debate about the archive because of the branding that will be known internationally. And... Uh, in the end, we settled for the secondary archive to kind of play with this identity of being the second sex, second gender, second to everything, um, second to get the solo shows, etc. Um, so second it's, world also? Yes. So reclaiming it. It's kind of learning from others. So for example, with the word queer, right? It also was a decorative, abusive term, let's say. And people started using it and reclaiming it as their own. So we thought, okay, let's play with the secondary aspects as well. And let's say that we are reclaiming it, we are taking it as our own, and then it stops being secondary, really, in that word as like the, the meaning that it had before. During my studies in Amsterdam, I was part of like a reading group uh, that became later like a support group that my podcast also kind of developed from because I worked with this amazing people that we kind of brainstormed different ideas. And then I had my graduation show and that's where Kitchen Conversation was born. And uh, the reading group was called Second Thoughts. So I really, oh, that's why I wanted to <laughs> also ask about the the name uh, because, yeah, and for similar reasons, we called it like that. So it's cool that the word second can also be, as you say, reclaimed and used uh, in the interest of, yeah, Central Eastern and beyond. Like second Europe, kind of, in a way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, the archive is online, so everything can be viewed by everyone uh, online and you have a huge uh, list of uh, amazing artists um, in kind of categorized in different groups so people can kind of search in an uh, easier uh, accessible way uh, how do you choose the artist or you said you don't want to choose but how how do these artists make it to your archive Yes, in the ideal world, there is no choosing and hopefully we'll be able to cover everyone and include them at some point. But of course, there is a limit at the moment in terms of our extensions, because as I mentioned, they are grant based. So within a certain grant, there is a certain amount of artists we can pay for, for joining, for writing the text and then pay the translators, etc. So when it comes to extensions within certain grants, there are two Roots. One, for more established artists, they are added by a local curator. So what we really focus on is that we work with local partners and local curators who make a selection of those artists from the, this specific country, because we don't want to have this external kind of eye coming again, traveling and saying that those are the artists you should include. Of course, there is a risk of uh, not including someone, but that's why we also make second, third extensions with the same country to go back again to that list and to look through who was maybe forgotten or didn't have time, etc. I know that curators have many different approaches. For example, our curator in Slovakia mentioned that she uh, contacted many galleries, uh, both like big uh, national museums and uh, galleries of art as well as smaller independent galleries to kind of recommend her artists uh, that she could include and based on that she made a list. Uh, some curators already work within certain institutions and they have access to this like and they're amazing art historians as well so there's really different approaches in terms of younger generation artists or emerging artists they can apply for an open call within each extension of the archive there is a selection process and then certain group is added to the archive and apart from that there's also always an option also to be added to the archive beyond any extension. So artists can email us that they are interested, then we send them what is needed and they can be added. I think it's a great option specifically for galleries that represent them because then they can support artists to not put this task of doing everything by themselves because that's kind of a plus and a minus. So it's amazing that they can join anytime, but beyond 
extensions we have limited funding and possibilities so it might be a bit more work heavy and how many extensions did you have so far first we had extension with Visegrad countries that means that means Poland <laughs> Czech Republic Slovakia and Hungary then we had extension with Ukraine and Belarus then we had extension again with Visegrad countries plus Albania Kosovo and Serbia then we had second extension with Ukraine just recently like few months ago to two months ago and then we are having another extension with Visegrad countries and Albania Kosovo Serbia again plus Bosnia and Herzegovina North Macedonia and Montenegro in March 2025 wow so it's really growing and pretty fast right Yeah, I would say that it's uh, for a project of this scale and also considering that pretty much all partners and us, the, the leading partner, are smaller scale institutions. It's really amazing to see how many artists are being added and how everyone is working towards making it as accessible and inclusive as possible. The idea is to basically connect So if I, for example, have a podcast about Eastern Europe, I can go to the archive and look for artists. But it's also for those artists to connect to each other. What's what's uh, your thoughts behind that? What's the kind of function of it? Yeah, so there are also a few layers, as you mentioned, to connect people, to make this network. So we also have a network of those 12 partners. So that's a one amazing thing is that we continue to collaborate beyond the archive. A certain partners are making certain projects together. Uh, we made many Festa, uh, 14, 14 yeah. yes, and etc. Then there are artists connecting with artists, art students getting knowledge within the art field, and also because there's essay sub page with many essays about women practices and art in Central and Eastern Europe, and even what is kind of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. So they ha there's this exchange of knowledge for researchers, curators. Some curators from across the globe really contact us to connect to a certain artists for exhibitions. And another layer is that, as I mentioned, this archive is very much text-based. So it consists of statements written by artists themselves. And therefore, we are trying to also reimagine what an archive can be and the structures of archival practices, which are often still rooted in a bit more conservative, maybe even patriarchal lens, let's say. Uh, so we are trying to think what an archive can be if it's done by women. And we really want to have this first-person perspective. So it's not the curators writing the artist bios, but the, bi uh, the artists themselves. I mean, speaking. bios are sometimes written in collaboration with curators. St statements are written by the artists themselves. However, I also know that some artists don't wrote work with text at all. So certain curators... Uh, need to be a bit more involved to help them with the process. But even if they help, it's very much a collaboration happening, not that someone is completely writing a text for them. However, there's also the case of those artists who are sadly passed away. And when it comes to artists who cannot write the statement, the curator tries to work with what they left behind. So there's also a lot of work with the archives of this specific artist. Um, so I know that certain curators, for example, choose to make a statement for them with quotes only. So it's still first person. Uh, but then the approach changes a bit. Would you say the archive represents feminist art? Well, that's just something that also came up during our conference in Budapest just recently. Because not every artist that is included in the archive would call themselves feminists. So for me, yes, because also many of the artists that are included do identify as, or like they, they do say that they are feminists and they are creating feminist art. However, it's not exclusively for that purpose. So for me, any practice that involves so many women and protects their work is a feminist practice in itself. But then I know that Feminism in East and the West is very differently understood. And then, of course, the Soviet times affected how we view feminism and how artists viewed themselves. So it's kind of open to an interpretation, I think, in that way. Yeah, and it's so interesting because I, of course, 
that's what I do. I kind of look for artists from this region. So I, I think I know already quite some people and uh, I've been doing this for three years. But when I opened your archive, there were so, so many names that I never heard of, which uh, yeah made me realize how many of amazing artists from this uh, yeah Central Eastern European region are out there. And we often don't hear about it here also in this kind of Western English speaking world, which made me really appreciate your work that you kind of have the reach to to go actually to the places and uh, and speak to people who actually work also more locally and not necessarily in... Yeah, it's true that uh, some of them are really not known internationally pretty much at all, but they are important for this local context. And uh, so it's, it's really amazing to see that. And it's the same for me when it comes to uh, the archive, you know, with each edition, I'm learning more and exploring new artists myself not being art historian I also have this advantage and disadvantage that like you know I don't have this extensive knowledge so the archive is also a great source for myself and for my own practice and understanding of female uh, female artists so it's uh, I can test it on myself first kind of which is also great after people listen to the podcast uh, I think it's gonna be out uh, yeah in a, in a couple of uh, weeks or a month uh, how can people artists who listen to the podcast be like I want to be part of the archive when can they apply in an open call okay so a few things <laughs> <laughs> first we just uh, did the second extension with Ukraine, as I mentioned. So I highly recommend to go check out the statements. The extension focused on women artists in war. As part of this extension, there is an exhibition at Galeria Labyrinth until 18th of August. So I highly recommend to go visit the exhibition. All 15 artists who were added to during this second extension with Ukraine, their works are exhibited there. So it's quite a unique situation. Ah, cool. Yes, because usually we don't make those physical shows then yes. yeah, of the people who are in the archive. The exhibition is curated by Valdemar Tatarchuk and Alia Segal from Ukraine. And they really put together a very moving and important show, in my opinion, that focuses on those pillars of home, body, identity within the framework of a full-scale invasion Many works are commenting on that, but as Valdemar mentioned during the conference, the opening conference, as an artist living and working in Ukraine, war is the very air you breathe. So you cannot really get away from it, even if you, if you don't really want to comment on that. So the works are very personal. There is, there is a photo book, for example, which shows kind of daily lives of young artists. However, you can feel this tension within the works. Uh, there's a video work that shows the holes in the ground and the landscape that is torn by war. Um, so really a lot of amazing and important works that I think should be highlighted. And I think it's also like when you go there to maybe read the curatorial text, to also dive a little bit more into into those aspects that Valdemar and Alia put into the into the show, because it really gives a good overview, especially since Galeria Labyrinth is one of those unique places in Poland that has been collaborating with Ukrainian artists way before the full-scale invasion. So they have this long-standing relationship with them as well and understanding of their practices. And then there is the new extension, <laughs> as I mentioned, coming in March 2025. The open call for younger generation artists will start in September this year. Uh, so they can look out for, for that. So nice to also have something that after the podcast, people can actually, you know, enjoy or like get uh, connected in a different way with art more also visually and uh, sensory and for those who are yeah around Poland uh, they just go and see yeah and uh, last but not least I don't know how much uh, you are familiar with this podcast but at the end we finalize by speaking about uh, food favorite food from home yes I love that part <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you you know you know the drill. So tell us something about uh, kitchens and meals and foods. 
Yeah, I was actually thinking about it because I like listening to a podcast and I always think, what is my favorite food? And so uh, my favorite food, meatballs in a dill sauce, mm. you know, this type of like uh, creamy dill sauce. But now... So the, good. Yeah, it's it's my favorite. And then you have like, you know, peas and carrots and mashed potatoes with it. But now my mom actually learned... By herself, she edited this recipe to make it um, vegetarian friendly. Mm -hmm. So now I have the vegetarian version and it's always made by my mom and it's the best. So sweet that she does it, especially this kind of traditional food, but like the veggie version. Yes, yes. She's really amazing. So yeah, it's and also, you know, like uh, something that really screams home for me. Yeah. Mm. And you've been living also abroad for quite some years. Yeah. So what were you craving there? Exactly this dish or was there other foods? That mm, you... I would say I craved this. Now I crave what I had there, actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what is that? Uh, so I lived in Thailand for two years and there's this street food pancake that I adore and it's really hard to get. It's kind of a roti with an egg and bananas and condensed milk on top. Wow, such a crazy combination. It's a crazy... It's like a dessert? It's, it's sweet, yes. Okay, but okay. then this egg adds... Because it's like very um, mildly done, so it adds very interesting texture to the pancake, uh, like to the inside of the pancake. I guess you can get it somewhere here or it's hard. Yeah, actually my partner decided to cook it for me uh, for like Valentine's because I couldn't get it anywhere. He was like, let me try. It was... The closest I've had in years. Yeah, I guess it's also like the herbs and all this like spices that I guess are j just very local and hard to get here. Yeah, I guess certain things. And I think with like, you know, Thai cuisine, I mean, of course now it's developed a lot in Poland and you can get even vegan versions, which is amazing. Uh, Poland in general, I think like cuisine wise, is really good at bringing other cuisines, but some things don't, don't make it here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for uh, the conversation and introducing the, the foundation and the archive. I think it's a great addition to the podcast and I'm sure a lot of listeners will benefit and enjoy uh, yeah, browsing through the archive. I will, of course, link it in the show notes. Great. Thank you so much and thank you for having us. And this was it for today. Thank you for reaching till the end of this episode. The next one is coming in four weeks, always on Monday. Please follow the podcast and leave a rating. I'm also happy to hear your feedback, so feel free to write me via Instagram or by email. All the needed info you will find in the show notes of this episode. In the meantime, take good care and we hear each other soon.